because everything I say is going to go better with a beverage. And I have a lot to say today. I'll even get on camera a little bit for it. As tradition dictates, we'll take a simultaneous sip of whatever you got with you until we reach enough people to talk. I'm going with the second, well, no, it's my first Zola of the day. Oh, that's good. Sorry I didn't give you any notice. All right, so with the uh, publication of, or at least the uh, the pre-publication of the chapter from Michael Wolff's book, Fire and Fury, which will be a major bestseller if it ever makes it to the market. <laughs> um, we're seeing a lot of questions lately about the president's uh, intelligence, his, his intellectual depth, and uh, whether he's flat out crazy. And I wanted to present to you a, a model for how to think of these things. Now, I base this on at least partly I'm informed by my experience. When I took the uh, a test called the GMATS, G-M-A-T, it's a test you take to see if you can get into a good business school. Now, one part of the test told a little story about some, some business situation, and then the, the question was not do you remember what happened in, in the story, but tell us which facts in this story that had lots of facts are the ones that matter. So if you were going to take the GMATs, the test to see if you're smart enough to be a business expert, if you will, someone who has an MBA in business, they don't say facts matter. They say some matter and some don't. And you need to be able to know the difference. Okay. Now, if you're a pundit, and your job is to go on TV and talk about politics, I would suggest that the more facts you know, the better you are at your job. So I would say a real good pundit is someone who knows a lot of facts, because you got to spew those facts out all the time. So knowledge clearly matters. But I would say you should think of knowledge on this scale, where the dumbest people are the ones at the bottom, who have no facts or the facts they have are incorrect. So the dumbest people just have everything wrong. They have no facts. And if you're a person who has facts, it's really easy to recognize these people. You can tell who doesn't have any facts. But I would suggest that you can tell from your own experience that these people don't necessarily think these people are smarter. All right. So that's the, the one of the uh, interesting aspects of intelligence, that the people who are smarter can tell with a lot of certainty that dumb people are dumb. But dumb people, because they're dumb, can't tell that someone is smarter than them. They might know that that person went to a better school or you know, knows more facts, but you will find that the people everywhere on the scale say that the people who are clearly above them are really stupid in some way or not. Now, here's the part I want to introduce that is the provocative part. I believe the highest level of intelligence is knowing what matters. Because not all facts are equal. And if you know what matters, you can be insanely effective without knowing a lot of facts. So that on the scale of intelligence, the dumbest people don't know any facts. The people who are far, far smarter know a lot of facts. And the people who are the smartest, at least in terms of effectiveness, are the ones who can tell which ones matter. Now, if you watch the coverage of the president from the enemy press, the ones who don't like him, they're almost completely locked in to this level. They do have facts, and when their facts conflict with his facts, or they believe he doesn't know the same facts they do, they feel smart, because they know more facts. Okay, But let's take some examples. They knew it was a fact. I'll just take you back in history a little bit. You're all tired of the history, but you remember when everybody said the president needs to spend more money to get the result he needs. 
That was like a fact, right? It seemed like a fact, but he didn't, and it worked out fine, because the president knew, apparently, that he didn't need to do that. Um, if you look at, let's say, ISIS, and we had a president come into office who everybody who knows a lot of facts, especially if they knew a lot of facts about ISIS, would tell you, you really ought to know a lot of facts. You can't be making these life and death decisions without knowing the whole landscape. I mean, you really need to nail your facts if you're going to send people out to die, right? That just seems common sense. President Trump came in, and I wasn't in the room, but so I'll sort of um, paraphrase what I imagine happened. Something like this. Who is the best general? Well, General Mattis, General Mattis, General Mattis. Does everybody agree among you generals that General Mattis would be a great general? Yeah, we all agree. He'd be great at this. Okay, I hire General Mattis. General Mattis, tell me what I need to know about ISIS. Um, General Mattis starts telling him about which you know, which groups are, are are against which groups and which cities are are being attacked and they're in what state and all this. And the president says, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't need to know all that. I, I just don't need to know all that. Tell me what's wrong that we could fix to get the result we want, which is less ISIS. And then one imagines, and again, this is just, uh, I'm, I'm doing this only as an example of uh, of how the facts matter and when they don't. You can imagine General Mattis saying, look, here's what we need. We need you to say, we're never going to leave, so the bad guys know they can't wait us out, and our side knows that this is a fight to win. Second, we need you to loosen our rules of engagement so that we can do what we need to do to get it done. Now the president knows almost nothing about ISIS, he doesn't know the name of the city that's being attacked. He doesn't know which, you know, which group of, uh, you know, partisans are on which side and they're switching every day. He might not know uh, that Assad is backing these people or bombing these people. He may not know what the Russians are doing. Then he went out and beat the snot out of ISIS because he knew which facts mattered, right? Take the uh, economy. Um, if you were a, an economist and you knew a lot about facts, you would say to yourself, my God, this president is taking credit for the stock market and the strong economy when every economist will tell you that most of the, most of the facts would suggest that Obama got things going and that really it's sort of an Obama economy for the first year of the new administration. You could argue that those are the facts. President Trump says, let me tell you what matters. What matters is consumer confidence. What matters is business confidence. So I'm going to cut regulations like crazy and tell everybody I'm cutting regulations. Well, do you understand all these regulations you're cutting, Mr. President? Eh, not in detail. But watch what happens. Consumer confidence through the roof. Business confidence through the roof. Economy go on to a new level. Did it matter that President Trump ignored what the economist would have called some facts he needed to know or needed to adhere to or needed to claim were true? He did not. He simply knew what mattered. He knew that, psych that psychology drives economics and that if you got the few things right you need to for psychology, you get economics, okay? So in all of the big issues, you can see that if they're big and complicated, that he just finds the thing that matters. Take the, uh, the Paris Climate Accord. Does the president know everything that you should know about science related to climate change? No, he does not. Has he made the effort to dig in and learn at least as much as he can? I don't know. Probably not. Was he still able to make a decision on the Paris Climate Accord without any of that base knowledge about the science? Yes, because the Climate Accord was an agreement, and he understands agreements, and the agreement was a bad one. 
How many facts did you need to know to know that the United States was paying most of the money, but the other people were doing most of the, creating most of the problem and weren't going to stop? You didn't really need to know a lot of facts to get the climate accord decision right. Now, now could there be a problem with this method when you get to stuff like, you know, real decisions about what to do about climate change? Yes, there absolutely could be. I'm not suggesting that this means that these people are always right and these people are always wrong. That would be crazy. The, what we have is what I'd call a, a pricey president, meaning that President Trump can probably get things done that regular politicians cannot. He just has a different kind of game, different kind of everything. But there may be things that happen along the way that we don't love. That's the pricey part. So if you look at the whole picture, you can, you can pick out what you care about and say, all right, is that good enough for the pricey part of this president? He's not free. He, he, he comes with a big price tag. He's cheaper than every other president. Well, if you're talking about, um, you know, some specific elements, yes. When I say pricey, I don't mean dollars and cents. I mean that there, there's going to be some breakage because that's, that's who we hired, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, and the, the mental illness accusation is very similar, is very similar to this, right? So if you are, if you're the person who doesn't know anything and your boss knows a lot and your boss makes a decision that you don't understand, you think your boss is either mentally unstable or stupid because you can't see what the person who has more facts sees. Likewise, the pundits who have plenty of facts, they're real good on the facts, they're looking at a president who can tell the difference between things that matter and things that don't, specifically in the psychology, persuasion you know, level of things. He, he just has more insight into a very specific talent that these people completely lack. I mean, they have almost none of it. So from their point of view, when they look at the decisions he makes, they should look crazy. In other words, he keeps making decisions that seem to ignore the facts as they understand them. But it's not that he's ignoring them as much as he knows which ones matter, and he doesn't care if there's a fact he, he puts out that doesn't pack, pass the fact-checking, if it gets him to a place he needs to go. Um, All right, is there any other topic that you want to run through the filter to see if there's the same, to see if the filter fits all the topics? You you may remember that it was a year and a half ago, uh, I made the... uh, I assume it was a mistake in the uh, in the fullness of time. I'm going to call this a mistake on my part. It's not a, not a mistake in terms of it was wrong, but in terms of appearances, it was a mistake because I get taken out of context. And what I said was that from a leadership perspective, you could learn everything you need to, to know to make an important leadership decision in an hour if you had the right people telling you what you needed to know. So I just gave you an example of that. President Trump doesn't need to have a deep understanding of ISIS if General Mattis and the other generals are sitting there and saying, look, there's just three things we need. We all agree. You do these three things and we're we're good to go. All right. So I I hold on to my theory that you do not need to know a lot of facts to be a leader. You do need to know which facts matter and how to get to them as quickly as possible. Um, Yeah, otherwise you would need to know economics to go grocery shopping, somebody just said. Um, You can also look at presidents who were great on the details and see that it didn't seem to help them as much as you thought. (laughs) <laughs> Radio Tom dumbass thinks you need to know every single thing all the time. Well, he would be stuck here. 
he would not necessarily do good on the GMATs where they ask him which of the facts matter and which ones don't. Uh, Carter was good on details, and as was uh, Obama. But remember, um, President Clinton was good on details too. But but here, actually, this is a real good example. So President Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton, had what most people would say was a successful presidency. And he triangulated. He probably had more more people on both sides than than we're going to see for a long time. Um, but despite his deep understanding of of the content of decisions, what was written on their on their whiteboard uh, during the entire campaign? It's the economy, stupid. So, so even though they knew that there were lots of things that mattered, they said, "Well, there's sort of one thing that really matters." You know, no matter how many facts you have, there's sort of only one thing that matters. If you've been watching uh, Newt Gingrich on TV lately talking about the uh, the tax plan, you can see this the same um, the same phenomenon uh, at work. So if I'm, I'm going to try to characterize Newt's opinion, if I get it wrong, I apologize to Newt, um, but I think this is close to his current opinion. So his opinion is that when consumers and voters see their paycheck getting bigger, that the Republicans will have a, a dominant advantage in the 2018 midterm elections. Because you can talk, talk, talk about policy and things and preferences and the future and all that, but your paycheck, that that's right in front of you. It's visual. It's, it's almost physical. You can feel it. You can see it. You know, you'll see the number, you can hold it in your hand, at least the pay stub if you have direct deposit. So Newt's opinion is that there's going to be a lot of facts in 2018, tons of facts. People will say this fact, that fact, vote for me because of this fact, vote for me because of this policy. Newt, who always operates up here, is telling you months before the election, there's only one thing that matters. Now, I'm, I'm oversimplifying a little bit. He, I'm sure he doesn't say only one thing matters. But that the dominant thing that will matter is that uh, people will see bigger paychecks. Now, my own opinion is that what will matter uh, more than that is what Republicans do or don't do for the black vote. I think that's, in my opinion, so, so Newt and I are both trying to operate here but we have a slight difference, not a slight difference, pretty big difference, in which facts matter. He says economics and, and the increase in your paycheck from the tax plan. I don't dispute that because, first of all, Newt's pretty smart. That theory makes sense on every level because it's physical, it's real, it touches every person. It's, it's just more immediate than every other kind of issue that's just a concept. But... I just don't think people change their vote because of a few paychecks. You know, maybe in a, a longer time frame they might, but I just I think they're going to forget by by election day. But if you're African American and something big has happened on the Republican side, something you wanted, and and you've asked the, Re the Republicans to do what you want, and the Republicans have said, "Look, we want your vote." They have to say it directly. I think Republicans have to say, we want your vote. Here's what we're going to do. Is that enough? You know, do, do we get your vote if we do these things? Short of that, I'm still, uh, I'm going to vote, op I'm going to predict opposite of Newt and say that it will not be a great election for the Republicans. But if they do that, then, then I, would, I would look for a blowout as well. If the Republicans get both those things right, there will be no competition in 2018. They've already gotten right the bigger paycheck, so I'm, I'm with Newt that far. But they still need that other piece, or, or people are going to be pretty locked into their, their team. All right. Um, <laughs> 
ideology and I don't like him is greater than economics. Yeah, that's that's sort of where I'm coming from. But if you do something that breaks the uh, the racist bubble, meaning that people just can't hold in their heads that he's a racist anymore because he's just doing he's doing too many things that are not that. Uh, so I think the uh, recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel probably deflated that whole racist bubble a little bit. You know, not nearly enough. But it's just hard to hold in your mind, well, he loved those tiki torch guys who are shouting anti-Semitic things at the same time he's doing exactly what they don't want him to do. You know, he's, you know, he's, he's good friends with Israel. Um, so that's part of it. But he's still got to do something for the black community. And if he doesn't, uh, I don't think he's earned his vote. And however 2018 comes out, I think Republicans just have to live with that. If they don't try to earn the vote, they got to live with the result. Uh, <laughs> I, do, I notice in the playbacks, I often end with, all right, so somebody's noting that I... I have that uh, visual tick at the end of some of my sentences, which I keep. I, I'm not trying to get rid of it because I think it's persuasive. <clears throat> Shouldn't have fired Amorosa? Nah, I don't think that mattered. What are your views on cryptocurrency? I, you know, I'm not sure anybody really has anything to offer on cryptocurrencies. Uh, I think we're all looking at the same information and nobody knows where it's going. All right. Um, I think I've talked about most of the other topics. I'm going to keep it on this today. And if you like this one, please, excuse me, please tweet it around. Take care.